Old woman works as janitor to see children, finds sealed bag with their names in the trash. A lonely woman whose family had moved to Europe works as a janitor to earn money to visit them, then she finds a mysterious sealed bag with their names on it in a trash can. Before the video starts, please make sure to subscribe and activate the notification bell to never miss our amazing stories. Debbie Francisco had never imagined that she would be on her own at the age of 67. She and her husband Douglas had raised three children, but shortly before he died, their oldest had moved to Australia and the other two followed her out. Now Debbie was alone and loneliness was her worst enemy. Traveling to see her children was impossible, the trip was incredibly expensive and Debbie's pension was very small. In order to save up for a visit to Australia, Debbie took a job as a cleaner in a big apartment building. Getting the job in the first place had been difficult because no one seemed willing to give a physically demanding job to a woman her age, but Debbie had managed to convince the building's administrator to give her a chance and he'd been more than happy with the results. It was a challenging job for a woman her age and sometimes painful because of her arthritis. Nevertheless, Debbie did her best. What she earned went straight into her savings account, but the money was piling up painfully slowly. Debbie's excellent work did not go unnoticed by the building's residents who would often give her tips. One day, a conversation with one of the residents would end up changing her life. Debbie was busy cleaning the elevator when Mrs. Yera walked in. She smiled to see Debbie cleaning the mirrors to a high polish. Good morning, Debbie, she said. How are you? I'm fine, Mrs. Yarrow, Debbie smiled, but Mrs. Yarrow could see that her eyes were swollen and red. Mrs. Yarrow frowned. You don't look all right. Can you take a few minutes off and come have a cup of coffee with me? Debbie nodded and followed Mrs. Yarrow up to her apartment. Soon Debbie and Mrs. Yarrow were sitting down to a hot cup of coffee. Now Debbie, her hostess said, tell me what's wrong. Debbie burst into tears. Oh, it's good news, really, she sobbed. My daughter is pregnant again. She's having her baby in July, but I won't be there. I just can't afford the trip, Mrs. Yarrow. She's in Australia, and the plane tickets are a fortune. Janice, that's my daughter, and her husband are doing well, but they just bought a new house because they are having twins, Debbie explained, and they can't afford to pay for my ticket, nor can my two sons help. We were hoping my youngest, Andrew, would be able to help, but he's had some financial setbacks, and I've never even met my first grandchild, Fiona. She's four. Mrs. Yarrow looked over at the photo of her four grandchildren on the mantel and imagined being so far away from them. She patted Debbie's hand consolingly. Oh my dear, she said tenderly. I'm so sorry, but don't give up hope. Sometimes things have a way of working out. I'll pray for you. Who knows? Anything can happen. Mrs. Yarrow, Debbie said smiling. Only you can cheer me up. You're right. I've always trusted in God to help me and I won't doubt him now. After Debbie left, Mrs. Yero picked up the phone and started calling all her neighbors and explained Debbie's predicament. Debbie's such a treasure, she said. She's always there when we need help or just a kind word. I think we can help her. Carried by Mrs. Yero's enthusiasm, the other residents started collecting money for Debbie, and before long they had $2,500. This, Mrs. Yero ascertained, was enough for the plane ticket with a little leftover. Mrs. Yero placed the money in a paper bag and stuck a big label on the outside that read, for Janice, Brad, and and are you. Then she sealed the bag and placed it in the trash can in the lobby which she knew was the first one Debbie cleaned when she arrived in the morning. The next day, Debbie arrived bright and early as always and the first thing she did was empty out the trash container. She lifted the lid of the can in the lobby and gasped. There was a paper bag in there with her children's names on it. Debbie pulled it out with trembling hands and opened it. She couldn't believe the sight that met her eyes. Inside was a neat stack of bills wrapped with a bright pink ribbon and a note that read, Bon Voyage. Debbie started crying, picked up the bag, and ran to Mrs. Yarrow's apartment. She rang the doorbell and held up the packet to a smiling Mrs. Yarrow. You did this, Debbie sobbed. Thank you. Mrs. Yarrow gave the weeping Debbie a big hug and told her, It was all of us, Debbie. We just wanted to show you how much you mean to us. Two months later, Mrs. Yarrow drove Debbie to the airport and saw her off on the first leg of her long trip to Australia. Two days later, Debbie was with her beloved children and met her sweet little granddaughter. A few weeks later, she sent Mrs. Yarrow a photo of herself holding two yawning newborns. Thanks to you, Debbie wrote, I was there for my daughter and have held my grandsons in my arms. God bless you for your kindness. If you enjoyed this story, you might like this one about a young woman who is ashamed of her crippled mother and tells her to pretend to be a maid when her wealthy fiancé comes to visit. A young woman who is ashamed of her crippled mother tells her to pretend to be a maid when her wealthy fiancé comes to visit. 
Nikki Weaver was a selfish, spoiled girl, and if we were to be 100% honest, we have to lay the blame at her mother Sophia's door. After all, Sophia had done the spoiling, lavishing love, attention, and all she could afford on Nikki. Nikki was an only child, and Sophia's husband had left her when she'd been severely injured in a car crash when their child was just three years old. Sophia had survived, but her injuries left her crippled and disfigured. With her husband gone, she focused all of her attention and love on her beautiful, bright little girl. But Nikki, instead of blossoming into a kind, generous person, had become demanding, nasty, and hurtful. But life had some lessons in store for her. It had all started in high school when Nikki suddenly noticed that Sophia didn't look like everyone else's athletic, pretty mom. Sophia had a limp and a terrible scar snaking down her neck. Nikki realized she didn't want anyone to know that Sophia was her mother. She refused to allow Sophia to attend any of the school functions where her classmates might see her. Look, mom, she'd said to Sophia, I'm the most popular girl in school and the prettiest. You don't look like my mom. Sophia had swallowed her pain. She wanted Nikki to be happy, to be popular, to be everything she had never been, and so she agreed. She had watched her daughter's graduation from afar so as not to embarrass her. Then Nikki went away to college, and during those years, Sophia had missed her dreadfully. She even managed to forget exactly how selfish and unfeeling her child could be. When Nikki told her mother she had been offered a job in their hometown, Sophia had been delighted. Nikki was back, and she was living at home again. But if Sophia thought the distance would make Nikki sweeter, she was in for a surprise. Not long after she was back in town, Nikki started dating her boss's son, a handsome young man who also worked for his law firm. Nikki told her mother, this is it, mom. George is the big time for me. No more pokey little apartments and cheap clothes. Sophia was shocked. She ran a successful online business and she thought their apartment was very pleasant. She had always bought her daughter the best she could afford, and Nikki's dismissal of it all as cheap and pokey hurt her feelings. Worse was to come when three months later Nikki came home with a diamond ring sparkling on her finger. He proposed, mom, she cried, and of course I said yes. Sophia smiled, happy for her daughter. I'm so glad you found a young man you love. Love? Asked Nikki. Surely you don't think I'm that stupid. You married for love and look at you now. I'm marrying George and I'll be a good wife, as long as he gives me the life I want. So, Sophia asked timidly, when do I meet George and his family? Nikki looked sideways at Sophia and put on her best fake smile. Oh, I'll organize something one of these days. She was thinking that she needed a place to stay until she married and it wouldn't do to let her mother know her real plans too soon. But a few weeks later, George told Nikki he wanted to see where she lived and meet her mother. Nikki thought quickly, Hun, you know my mom is a businesswoman, she's away on a trip right now, but you can come for dinner. That afternoon, Nikki came home and told her mother, Listen, you have to make an amazing dinner cause George is coming over. Sophia was delighted and started making dinner and set a beautiful table for three. Nikki came out of her bedroom looking like a movie star and stared at the dinner table. Three? She asked. What are you thinking, Mom? It's only George and I having dinner. Nikki gasped Sophia. This is my house. I'm your mother. Not tonight. Nikki said coldly, Tonight you're the maid. I can't have him looking at you and deciding he doesn't want to marry into the family. Sophia was utterly humiliated when George arrived and Nikki introduced her as the maid, and a few minutes later dismissed her telling her she need only return in the morning. Sophia took her handbag and left. She was devastated and called her best friend Anne and asked if she could come over. Anne, a pretty and lively woman who lived in the same building, welcomed Sophia. What's happened? Anne asked when she saw Sophia's unhappy face. Sophia didn't want to tell her, but eventually, the whole story came out and Anne was furious. You let this girl trample all over you, cried Anne angrily. She deserves a good lesson. You sleep here tonight, and tomorrow I'm fixing Miss Nikki for good. Nikki spent a lovely evening with George. They ate the delicious dinner Sophia had prepared, danced and spent the night together. But the early morning would bring Nikki a huge surprise. George and Nikki were still sleeping when the front door opened and a cheery voice shouted, Nikki, it's me, I'm home. Nikki wrapped herself in a dressing gown and stumbled to the sitting room where Anne was standing, beautifully dressed and carrying a suitcase. Good morning, sweet daughter. She cried happily to Nikki's amazement. At that moment, George walked in. Hello, said Anne, shaking George's hand enthusiastically. So you're the man who's finally taking Nikki off my hands. I must tell you I'm so relieved. George was stunned and Nikki was horrified but Anne was on a roll. Oh my poor man, you have no idea what you are setting yourself up for, she's so demanding. Everything has to be just so and always her own way. That's not true, cried Nikki, eyeing George nervously. 
Oh yes, it is, said Anne. And I'm so glad you're rich, George. From what Nikki told me, you can afford to buy her all the things she believes she deserves. Money is the key to happiness, she always says, and you've got plenty. I never gasped Nikki, but George was looking at her with an odd look on his face. Then he quietly went back into the room, put on his shoes, and walked out of the door. You stupid woman, screamed Nikki at Anne. What have you done? Only what you deserve, Nikki, Anne said, and saved that young man a great deal of heartache. You have been using and abusing your mother for years, and it's time you face the music. She loves you, but she deserves a better daughter. Just like that young man deserves a better wife. Nikki was devastated. Never before had anyone spoken the truth outright to her face. She started thinking about all that she'd done and how she treated her mother and she felt deeply ashamed. Nikki humbly went to Anne's house to beg her mother's forgiveness and asked her to come home. It was the beginning of Nikki's transformation. She wasn't always sweet, of course, and she did have a few back slips once in a while, but she was a kinder and more loving daughter to Sophia. If you enjoyed this story, you might like this one about a man who uninvited his mother to his wedding after she refused to give him the large sum of money he demanded. Rick is the only boy in a family of six girls and the last to get married, so he is expecting his mother to give him a large cash gift, but he is bitterly disappointed. Rick Gordon was getting married and except for his fiancée, he was the only person in the world who thought he was ready for such a serious commitment. The problem was that Rick was irresponsible and spoiled, but he was also charming. He was the seventh child, the only boy after his parents had already welcomed six girls, so Rick became everyone's pet. When his mother and father tried to impose discipline, one of his sisters would go around their back and Rick would get his way. His mother, who loved her son but had no illusions about him, knew that unless Rick grew up fast he was heading for a fall and this wedding might be the pebble that would trip him up. Rick's fiancée, Sandy, was happily planning the whole wedding with her mother, something Rick's mom, Carmen, had already done six times with her own daughters. Rick started thinking about his sister's weddings, and he decided that he was going to strike a blow for gender equality. Mom, he asked casually, just two weeks before the wedding, how much does a wedding dress cost these days? Goodness, said Carmen, the last one was for Rita, and that cost $8,300, but I know they can be a lot more. Well then, said Rick smiling, I'll take a check for $8,300. What? gasped Carmen. What do you mean? I'm getting married and I want what you've given my sisters, Rick said. I can use the $8,300, believe me. But you said you were renting your tux, you even went with dad to pick it out, said Carmen, astonished. I am renting the tux, but I think you owe me that money, Rick said coldly. I'm your child too, I have rights. Rights? Carmen was starting to get angry. You want money because it's your right? Yes, cried Rick, who was starting to lose his temper. I didn't see you quibbling over the cost of six wedding receptions, so why be stingy over a measly $8,300 which you can well afford? I may be able to afford it, cried Carmen, but you don't deserve it. Rick turned deadly pale. I knew it, he gasped. You never loved me the way you loved my sisters, and now you're finally showing your true colors. That's not true, Rick. I love you all equally, Carmen said. But the truth is that you've taken every advantage we've given you for granted. You gambled away your college fund, borrowed money from your sisters you will never pay back. So you won't give me the money? Asked Rick, enraged. Sandy's parents are giving us an apartment and $200,000 of seed money. All I wanted from you was a little pocket cash. $8,300 is not pocket cash, Rick, Carmen said, horrified and I hope you don't gamble with Sandy's money or your marriage won't last a year. Don't you ill wish my marriage, Rick howled. I don't even want you there. You'd better stay away. Rick, gasped Carmen. You don't mean that. I mean it, mother, Rick hissed. Dad is welcome, but you are not. That night Carmen told her husband Bill the whole story and she ended up crying in his arms. Bill said, maybe we should just give him the money. I know not going to this wedding is breaking your heart. No, Bill, Carmen said firmly. We gave way to Rick too many times when he was growing up. This is our last chance to stand firm, to make him see what he is doing with his life. So the wedding went ahead without Carmen, but Rick ended up feeling very alone because his father and his six sisters refused to go without his mother. There was a moment when Rick looked around and not one of those beloved faces was there, and he wondered if he had made a mistake. When he came back from his honeymoon in Tahiti, Rick confessed to his new wife that he missed his family. Rick, Sandy said, I think you need to go over there and apologize. Apologize? Rick cried indignantly. I was right. I deserve that money. Oh dear, murmured Sandy, who was turning out to be a lot more sensible than Rick had imagined. 
I don't agree. From what you told me, your mom and dad had to clean up a lot of messes for you, expensive messes. Yes, admitted Rick. But be honest with yourself, Rick, said Sandy, who sounded more and more like Carmen by the minute, then pick up that phone and apologize to your mom and invite her to dinner on Saturday. Rick grumbled and sulked, but eventually he picked up the phone and called his mom. Mom, he said when she picked up. It's Rick, listen, I think maybe, you're right. What I mean? Are you trying to apologize, Rick? Asked Carmen sweetly, because if you are you need to try harder. Okay, mom, said Rick humbly. I'm sorry. I know you and dad have cleaned up a lot of messes for me, and I haven't been the most responsible person in the world, but with Sandy's help I want to be a better person. Oh, Rick, Carmen said, with tears in her eyes. I'm so glad. I love you, my son, and of course, I forgive you. Mothers always do. A week later, Carmen, Bill, and Rick's six sisters, their husbands, and children all went to Rick and Sandy's home for dinner, and it ended up being the best wedding celebration ever. Tell us what you think and share this video with your friends. It might inspire them and brighten their day. See you in our next video.